All right, let's take a look at the broad market action right now. We are in rally mode here across North America. In fact, the TSX has been advancing at a pretty steady pace. We are looking at a great gain north of 1%. Overnight, we had Chinese stocks rocketing higher after authorities took a raft of steps to bring investors back to one of the world's worst performing equity markets. Now, most of those gains were gone by the end of the session illustrating how China's efforts to boost its markets are struggling in the face of economic worries. Our next guest says this is lowering business confidence and between that and erratic government decision making, instability is growing in the country. For join, we're joined. For more, we're joined by Margaret McQuaig Johnson. She's a board member at the China Strategic Risks Institute. Thanks so much for joining us, Margaret. Let's start first by identifying the problems that you see uh, taking hold in China. Well, they have a multitude of problems right now in their economy. And I think one of the things we saw yesterday um, and really in the last 24 hours in the market was their in inclination to interfere rather than bring in long-term reforms. We've seen uh, consumer demand uh, decreasing. We've seen uh, GDP growth uh, flattening out uh, only 0.8% uh, in uh, April to June. And, uh, and we've seen um, exports uh, decline 10% um, over last year uh, in the same period. And uh, we've seen youth unemployment really soaring 21.3%. And that's concerning the government. And so rather than put in place measures to, to boost youth employment, they've decided not to show their stats on that factor anymore. And they've also given a general direction to their economists to, uh, to stop talking about what their work is and, and what they're finding. And so all of this is leading to um, lower business confidence, which is really concerning. Is the growth miracle over in China? Well, I, I think we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, one of the things that the party relies on uh, for its continued credibility is stability. And we haven't been seeing that. Um, the other thing that requires st um, the stability um, is foreign investment and domestic investment in China. And again, uh, government policies have been erratic. We've seen their up and down uh, COVID uh, policies uh, that turned on a dime, resulting in uh, tens of thousands of people killed and businesses killed. And uh, we've seen uh, invest, investment faltering. And, and so we've seen, you know, uh, CEOs disappearing and companies like Ant Group being broken up. And it's hard for uh, CEOs to understand what's happening here um, because of the, the lack of um, uh, transparency. Mm -hmm. And some of them must wonder if they're going to be next. We even saw the foreign minister disappear. Like what country does that? It's um, and and there are problems with the negative list, where uh, this is the list uh, that um, indicates what foreign direct investment is allowed uh, in whole or in part in different sectors, and sometimes a, a sector will just disappear. So it looks like it's being allowed, but then it's it's um, uh, forbidden under uh, other separate legislation. So a lot of problems that, that uh, are leading to loss of confidence. Well, on top of those shady practices, there's also, I mean, we could just call it a trade war between the U.S. and China. To what extent is that also exerting pressure? Well, there's a tra trade war and, and more deeply, there's a, a conflict in interpretation of how the two countries are going to collaborate on technology. We've seen uh, huge national security risks identified in the U.S. associated with Chinese technologies. We see this both in Chinese private companies in the U.S. and being put on entities lists. We've seen this in collaborations in, in uh, universities being constrained. 
And, uh, and now we see that the U.S. is going to try to renegotiate their science and technology agreement with China in the next six months, if China will come to the table to do that. And that's going to further restrain uh, science and technology collaboration. Uh, and Canada has a play in this, too. We have a science and technology agreement with China. Um, the U.S. one uh, is was due to end on Sunday, and they're trying to extend it uh, temporarily. Canada is just automatically renews every five years. You mentioned Canadian and Canadian businesses for so long on the back of China's huge growth. Is this has been a fruitful area for Canadian businesses to go and expand? internationally. If your business today eyeing China as a market for expansion, are the risks higher today than they were, say, five years ago? I would say they're definitely higher. We've seen significant problems in Canadian and other foreign uh, joint ventures in China, with the Chinese partner moving to take over uh, the, not just the technology, but the entire joint venture and taking the IP with it. Um, and, and we've seen other problems in uh, uh, reductions in foreign direct investment. Our uh, pension plans have been heavily invested. Uh, CPPIB uh, invested um, ten, almost 10 percent of their investment, overall investments. And now with the Chinese markets uh, in, in disarray and, and further problems like the CCP committees in every company, taking a stronger role and sometimes replacing management decisions with their own, Canadian companies are looking to diversify to other countries mm -hmm. in the region. And, and that's actually facilitated now by our Indo-Pacific strategy. We're in better shape than other countries because we have a strong Indo-Pacific strategy brought in last November, and that's supporting Canadian companies to diversify to countries that have rule of law and, and uh, follow normal business practices. How are you thinking about the Taiwan risk? And, and you know, we've talked to, and economically, we've talked geopolitics. There are some that out there that say the market is not pricing in a, a high chance that if China moves on Taiwan, you might have to see a Russia-style exodus out of China because it will be politically unpalatable to continue operating there. Right. And um, President Biden has been alluding to, to that recently. Um, what we see with the downturn in the economy is more um, unhappiness on the part of the population, certainly those unemployed university graduates and others. And, and consequently, um, the government may decide to unify the country behind its own government by attacking Taiwan, uh, using national sentiment and, and nationalistic fervor to, uh, you know, historically take over Taiwan, a, a democratic neighbor. And that's a big danger for Taiwan. And, and the, the worse the Chinese economy gets, the higher the risk that that's going to happen in the shorter term.